again, many IROs are already feeling the pressure from the investors and their expectations from the companies on their sustainability roadmap and how much they are able to embrace and integrate sustainability factors into their strategy and operations. Recently, a significant bill which regulates UK pension funds and therefore affects how they invest in companies has been given royal assent. This will mean that a significant number of the world's largest asset managers and pension funds will have to revisit their approach to ESG and their engagement with companies. ESG considerations will become the norm when making investment decisions. Undoubtedly, this will have a sizable impact on IR programs and investor reach for every single listed company. London remains the most invested city in the Turkish market, taking this change to the top of our agendas. We are very fortunate to have with us today the UK Pension Minister, Guy Opperman, in partnership with Broom Yazar. Mr. Minister, a very warm welcome to you. The UK is the first G7 country to legislate for net zero by 2050, so my sincere congratulations to you on this very important development. We are very keen to hear your views on the recent legislation and the roadmap, including the UK government's take at <coughs> pension schemes and TCFD disclosures, uh, the impact of climate change on pension policy, and the direction of travel on ESG 2.0, as you like to call it. So without further ado, let me turn it over to you, Mr. Minister. So uh, thank you, Asli, and thank you to the uh, Turkish Investment Relations uh, Organizations who invited me to speak. Uh, and I hope it is an opportunity for me to set out uh, the direction of travel that the UK is presently going on, uh, what it is that we see ESG developing into, and what ESG 2.0 looks like. So. If I start with a couple of basics, it seems to me, if you're interested and passionate and working in investment, then you are concluding and reasoning that you are investing for the long term. That is what all investment surely is about. And if you aren't taking account of climate change, there may not be a long term, both for all of us but also for all of our investments. So it seems to me that ESG starts with the E element of ESG, the environmental element, as the most important. I'll come to the other parts, social and governance in a second, but the focus must always be on the impact of climate change, both on our way of life, on our kids' and our grandkids' way of lives, but also on the investments that uh, we are making, whether that is as advisors, or whether that is stocks and shares or pension schemes that I'm responsible for. So the UK is on a journey, and I suggest other countries around the world are on a similar journey. But I'd like to think we are, so to speak, at the front of the queue. We have addressed these things uh, in a very early way. So the journey can be framed in two ways. On the one hand, you have the decision as uh, the UK government to be the first G7 to legislate for net zero by 2050. It's a big statement with massive impact on investment, the way we live, the way we drive cars, our houses, our heating, uh, travel, everything. And on the other hand, we have coming this November, uh, the COP26 conference in Glasgow, where all the world will come together to determine how it is they're going to tackle climate change. The consequence of that is that you've got the framing between the G7 uh, net zero decision and the decision uh, of COP26. These two things are massive. And the COVID pandemic, in my view, has made it even more serious and important. Because if, if you were scared and frightened by a pandemic and the impact of that, then the impact of long-term climate change is something that we must now be taking even more seriously in my view. So the UK is on a journey, and I have been lucky for the last nearly four years to be the pensions minister trying to guide the UK on that journey. So there is no doubt that 
uh, we have brought forward legislation. We were one of the first countries to legislate for ESG, and that impacts and affects, obviously, the City of London and the fund managers and the investment relations organisations who are making those investments, but it also impacts massively on the pension schemes that I'm responsible for, which have over one trillion pounds worth of assets at their disposal. That is an awful lot of buying power. And when they are investing in an ESG friendly way, that has a massive, massive impact. Now, uh, as the right that I have brought forward um, the um, Pension Schemes Act of 2021, which was signed by Her Majesty in January of this year, and it, it basically puts climate change at the heart of um, pension scheme investing. And it also signs up the UK as the first country in the world to be accommodating TCFT. That is the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. Putting it bluntly, that is a reporting arrangement that puts you, the consumer, and you, the advisor, in charge and understanding what it is that is going on in terms of the ability of your investment to take account of climate change. Now, I see ESG as a win-win. It is a win-win because it is an opportunity for those who really understand the companies they invest in to invest in a better way. And asset managers and investment relation advisors who do this properly and well will unquestionably uh, get more business. There's no doubt whatsoever. Because the days of being a passive manager who merely votes with the herd, in my view, are long gone. The consequence of this is that I also see it as a win-win for those places uh, who are investing in an appropriate way. So I hope that what you see is that you believe that the City of London and the UK is a location that has embraced ESG and has the expertise to invest overseas assets in a way that is in an ESG friendly way. And that is what I am I'm trying to explain what we're doing and trying to set out a roadmap of where I think the UK and uh, many other countries are going. But this is also an unashamed sell because I believe very strongly that the UK has great scope to be a world leader in terms of inward investment and inward management of funds from abroad. So I've got a couple of key messages I'm going to make a point with, and I'm managing also, I'm working from home, as you can tell, I'm managing yes. a small puppy that is making a little bit of noise in the background. So we'll try and manage that. And we're expecting someone at the door. So we're happy to see him, no worries. It's all right, okay. So <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, there's a couple of key other points, which would be, the first is stewardship. Mm -hmm. so traditionally, stewardship is something that um, was, I, I know the companies I invest in, I read their reports, I read their accounts, I've met the managing director, and therefore I really understand what it is they're doing, all right? It, it's a totally different change now. So if, I, if, if you are investing in Shell, or British Petroleum, or a fossil fuel company, come here, sweetheart. Um, then you're in a position that you genuinely need to understand. Hold one thought, hold one second. Okay. Um, Home working, UK style. Sorry about that. Absolutely, so, no worries. You're genuinely trying to engage in a better way with the companies that you are investing in um, and guide them it, to an ESG path so that they genuinely understand what they're dealing with. Now, um, my view is that engagement is way different to what everybody was doing five years ago. And it's going to get way more different over the next five years. That leads on to voting. How it is large-scale fund managers and pension schemes vote on strategic decisions in the company they invest in is definitely going to change. No question. 
No question it's changing. Um, I, I, I want to make two final points and then I'll do a bunch of questions. There is an argument that if you want to have the most clean ESG fund that you possibly could have, it's really simple. You divest and all you do is buy tech stocks. Now, that is utterly, utterly, utterly wrong. Anyone who preaches the language of divestment to you really doesn't understand ESG, doesn't understand stewardship, and is utterly failing in supporting their own country's economy. So you will have um, fossil fuel companies who uh, you think longer term have got to change into clean energy companies. If you divest from them, then the consequence of that is that they'll be starved of capital. They won't invest in that way. They may sell to someone else who doesn't have your uh, clean energy beliefs. And the, the one thing that you want to do, which is to create in your own country and throughout the world, an ESG uh, appropriate economy, that disappears. So it is not, that is not the way ahead. The way ahead is to engage and shape the companies that you're investing in. That is proper stewardship. I finish on the last two points, which is the social and the governance angle. Um, there is a long journey that the entire uh, world is going on to look more like the world that we live in. It is not appropriate longer term to have uh, FTSE 100 companies or companies that have only got men on boards. Uh, that have no diversity whatsoever. And there is no doubt that the UK is trying, and I think other countries are as well, to uh, ensure that, they, that governance is done in an appropriate way. And a good example of that is diversity. Now, the second is the social element of ESG is often misunderstood and, uh, and sort of overlooked. We in the UK accept that is a problem, which is why we are engaging in a call for evidence as to what it is a social uh, ESG investment looks like. The mm -hmm. easy example is supply chains. Um, is there massive exploitation or in the supply chain to ensure the profit that you so enjoy? And is that appropriate on a long term basis? For that company to be one that you invest in. Now, that is a work in progress, but I suspect all countries are going to be looking at how it is that um, the social element of ESG uh, is implemented in their investment strategy. I hope that is a short uh, gallop through what it is we are trying to do, where we are going, and I'd be delighted to take questions, hopefully without a small dog interrupting and barking a lot. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, you know, we know that uh, we do get the fastest results when uh, there is work done together with policymakers, with NGOs, with companies. So UK definitely seems to be at a very, very good place. And I hope other company countries will also follow suit. So with this kind of uh, um, a, a, a very um, inclusive start. Uh, how do you see the UK pension and investment landscape changing in three to five years time? I mean, the numbers that you have suggested, these are incredible. One trillion pounds of assets under management. As you did say, this is uh, an awful uh, lot of uh, power to uh, drive the companies to change. It's, it's uh, really driving good appetite. So uh, I think there will be a number of key trends. So uh, the best example is, if if you believe in ESG, then it is inevitable, in my view, you believe in climate change and the work that the COP conference are doing, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, if, if, if the logical extension of that is that uh, we all have to get to net zero by 2050, if our kids and grandkids want to enjoy this wonderful planet, then the question every country and every investment fund has to ask themselves is, how is it I am going to get my company, my investment and my country to that place? Now, that's going to require a lot of capital, 
a massive, massive amount of capital. And that capital is only found in three places. Direct taxation, the government pays. Private sector finance, uh, I've got a wealthy company, I'm investing for the future, et cetera, et cetera. Or thirdly, stocks and shares or pension schemes. Now, uh, taxation is very difficult, particularly in a pandemic world. So most governments are short of cash to do this sort of investment. Secondly, private sector capital needs some assistance and normally is short of capital itself, uh, which is where, in my view, pension schemes have an opportunity. And investors uh, who are investing that money have an opportunity. And it is a win-win because what we're trying to envisage is what the world looks like in three, five, 10, 25 years time, and then invest in the products that the world needs to get us to net zero. Because those companies and those investments that are made in a net zero economy will be utterly crucial and very remunerative. You will make good returns on those type of investments. And yeah. those companies that don't invest in an ESG friendly way, in my view, will be starved of investment and their stock price will go down. Now, so where I think investor relations and asset managers have massive power now is to see the future opportunities and then to invest in those future opportunities. So if you reverse back 20 to 30 years ago, clearly, uh, if you had seen the future, you would have seen Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Google, Amazon. These were the companies that clearly were the new industrial revolution that we all should be investing in. Now, the clean energy companies the companies that produce electric cars, the companies that uh, work out how to do hydrogen, the companies that uh, can do um, uh, home heating without using gas boilers. These are the companies of the future who will need a lot of capital and a lot of support as they go forward. And in my view, um, that's where the opportunity lies as well. And it is an opportunity for any investor um, it is not only the right thing to do, it also makes uh, a good return. So that's the direction of travel. And I, my personal view is ESG is going to be the utter heart of all of that. And uh, there will be way greater involvement in the running of companies. So if you, if you look at a company like BP or Shell, massive petrol companies, fossil fuel companies, those companies would traditionally the only thing that a investor would have been interested in, in the past was, are you producing a good return and a good dividend? Is the share price going up? Do I get a good, good dividend? If so, I will produce, I will put my money there. The problem is these massive companies are facing potential divestment by some. So that's capital withdrawal, which means share price probably goes down. They also need to make massive investments to become a clean yeah. energy company. So those sort of companies, the relationship of heavyweight investors with those sort of companies saying, how are you going on that journey? Will you get there? Because if you are going to get there, I will support you. And if you've got a good roadmap to get there, my investors, my pension fund will say, you are going to be the one who solves this problem. Because it is not, with no disrespect to the Turkish government, British government, any government, they are not going to the people who are going to invent hydrogen, who are going to invent um, battery power such that we can run our cars in a proper way, who are going to do carbon capture and storage, who are going to do all of the technical uh, innovations. That will be by private sector companies who we all invest in. And that's the journey we're all on. It's exciting, though. Coming back to your comment on investor relations, we also believe that uh, investor relations professionals play a very, very critical role in advancing with sustainability matters, in coordinating with um, and even mobilizing policymakers, communicating the expectations of the investment community to company management, 
and really getting the management to comprehend the importance of implementing these measures, integrating sustainability into every single step of decision making and doing business. For this purpose, um, as the Turkish IR Society, we have also taken sustainability matters as a strategic priority. Uh, we are working very closely with our regulators here and uh, also with the listed companies. Uh, we would like to assist them in their sustainability journeys. We work hard to encourage them to make higher quality disclosure. Um, on the company side, we are also seeing a growing pressure from the investors, but not all of them, of course, seem to have the same level of expertise or resources that are dedicated to ESG. Some are still at um, entry level, some are applying negative screening, others have their own industry-based ESG expert analysts. Uh, but as you suggested, uh, this is indeed a journey. Uh, time is running out though, and we need to act fast, we need to act bold, uh, the UK certainly has done this uh, and um, congratulations once again. Uh, let's see which countries do follow suit. Um, in consideration of time, uh, Mr. Minister, do you have any closing remarks for the companies? Well, I think the listed companies, whether they are based in Turkey, whether they're based in London, Frankfurt, Washington, have to look at themselves. and. Um, I always start with one thing. As a, as a politician, um, I, always, I was taught a great phrase, and I believe it very strongly, which is, if you want to change the world, look in a mirror. Now, that starts, everything starts with yourself. So if, if you genuinely want a future for your kids and your grandkids, then uh, an acceptance that a world where... Um, climate change is utterly taking over will make the present pandemic uh, seem uh, really quite minor by comparison to the impact that it would have over a 20 to 30 year period. We've had an awful pandemic for one year, but the climate change disaster that could potentially face us if we don't tackle this is way, way worse than that. Now, so if you want to change the world for yourself, your kids, your grandkids, what are you doing? Now, that applies as investors, but it also applies as the companies. So the conversation we have with big fossil fuel companies in the UK or around the world is um, this is also not only a personal choice uh, as you as a you know, managing director or employees, but it is also a choice because your company has to evolve. The, the truth is coal, for example, is not a product that the, um, that the, the, the world is going to be using long term. So you cannot work on a basis of continue to extract coal and make a living out of it. We know it is really damaging. Therefore, we have to develop solar, wind farm, tidal, hydrogen, clean energy in the form of electric, um, uh, hydroelectric power. All of these things are the sort of things that your energy business, for example, can do. You are the experts and there is money to be made and shareholder return. And that is the big change that they need to come to. And that's the conversation that investors are going to have to have with individual companies because it's a stark choice. I don't, we, and the, the, the simple choice is to say, we don't want to divest to sell out of your business because it's a great local business or because we've always done business with you. But we have to know that you are on a journey to get to net zero and to be, a, you know, Shell or BP have to become a clean energy company where they don't do oil and gas and coal. That is a big step for them. And it will take time. It will. But we have to be, we have to act and we have to act quickly. And, and, uh, well, that journey. was great. We're all on a journey. So the UK, I, I, I frame it, I deliberately framed it over, a, it's in the time period that I have been minister. Genuinely, we have done so much from, you know, we've introduced ESG. We have been the first country to legislate for net zero. We're doing the G7 in June in Cornwall. We're doing COP in this November. 
These are massive steps that we've taken yeah. very quickly. And um, the change is uh, dramatic in terms of uh, the way in which uh, asset managers, pension schemes have changed their views. If I had had this conversation five years ago, A, no one would have come. Secondly, most people would deny or be skeptical about the impact of this. And thirdly, they would say, what can I do? I think most people accept the science now. Secondly, they can see there is a way in which they can make a real difference. And thirdly, we can get there. We can do this, but we have to work together. And that is surely something worth striving for. That is so true. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. No, I, thank you for, for the opportunity. Very kind of you. Um, I, I make the point that London is open for business and we will be very keen to assist in investments in any way uh, going forward because we feel that the UK is the lead in terms of ESG investing. And that's where I think there is opportunities ahead. But I hope when the world gets back to normal, I'd be delighted to come and do a presentation in person rather than uh, battling my small Labrador puppy. I note that down <laughs> and we will be very, very happy to have you here. Thank you for being so generous with your time. Thank you so much. Take care. Very nice to meet you. Bye bye.